What is up, everyone? Welcome back to the show. I'm Anthony. And this is James. We're continuing our Harry Potter once a week episode saga. It's like the ABC marathon every Christmas. Yeah, (laughs) it's so fun. But no commercials, just a couple ads here and there. (laughs) But uh, (laughs) we love Harry Potter. So if you're not into Harry Potter, we're really sorry about this, but we're we're doing it. We're not going to stop. I don't think we talked about um, our Hogwarts houses in the last episode. Oh, yeah, we didn't. Because we both uh, are big fans and we've taken the Pottermore test multiple times. Which is a really, it's a personality test, so you can't really cheat on it to like, oh, I'm 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 brave and courageous, so I'm, yeah. I'm trying to get in Gryffindor. Yeah, you can't you can't cheat the system. Yeah, because it's, it's very in uh, in depth in terms of situational uh, questions. And uh, I am a Ravenclaw. I did it twice and twice Ravenclaw. Congratulations! Thanks. I'm a Slytherin. Not surprised. I'm there. not not sure what that says about me, but everyone every time it I tell every, it says all you need to th- know. That's what everyone always says to me. They're like, "Yeah, that makes sense. You seem like a Slytherin." I'm like, "I guess that's a compliment. <laughs> Probably not." You're, so that means you're closer to being a serial killer than I am. What are you talking about? I'm sure plenty of people in Ravenclaw were still serial killers. Wasn't a witch or wizard that turned bad? That wasn't in Slytherin. That doesn't mean they're all bad. Yeah, but everyone who turned bad was from Slytherin. <laughs> no one, no one from Ravenclaw it, turned may, bad. Maybe I am bad. Who knows? And, and we'll learn a little bit more about the Slytherin house in this in this. Uh, uh, chapter of the of the saga, yeah. especially in terms of, obviously we discovered everything for the first time in Sorcerer's Stone. But Chamber expands on the world. We learn more about the history. We get new characters. Like we go to Nocturne Alley. We see the Burrow with the Weasleys. We we learn that there's a Ministry of Magic in uh, the Hogwarts founders, the four founders of Hogwarts. We learn their backstory thanks to McGonagall. So J.K. Uh, each film she slowly uh, each book she slowly builds upon the world more and more yeah not just the world but the story of harry potter and we learn more about his backstory and his future path as well every every film but chamber of secrets is such an underrated movie i don't know why this movie gets so much hate in the harry potter franchise a lot of people talk so much smack about it but i think quit talking smack yeah i think people forget how good it is because obviously it's in the shadow of sorcerer's stone because these two have that same tone that chris columbus set up the follow-up so Yeah. yeah So I think it's kind of forgotten. And there are some parts of it where you can say are kind of corny, which make you forget about it and not love it so much. But I'm telling you, this is one of the best book to film adaptations in the entire franchise in general. And for me, I love it because at times this feels like an Indiana Jones movie. It feels like an ad- adventure film, especially like the third act when Harry and Ron are doing all their exploring and discovering secrets with the help of Hermione's clever research and Hagrid's hints. It turns into a great adventure film. We have great we have more magical monsters. We are more in the classroom, so more magic, more the action sequences in this film are fantastic and it feels the most like as an audience member, I think of all the movies that you're at Hogwarts, it feels the most like you're there. Yeah, that makes sense. The Indiana Jones one, because the Chamber of Secrets you can compare to any one of the the underground um, catacombs that Indiana yeah. is, is exploring for sure. Before we continue, if you want to help support Raiders of the Lost podcast, the best thing you can do is share our show with your friends and family members, as well as becoming a patron at Patreon.com/slash Raiders of the Lost podcast. Patrons get perks like personalized videos, podcast schedules, top tier patrons get a monthly shout out on the podcast. You'll have access to exclusive video content like bonus episodes of the podcast that only patrons get to see, plus monthly giveaways for patrons only. Head on over to our website, RaidersOfTheLostPodcast.com to check out all of our sources of content, our merch, our custom movie posters, and become a patron there as well. Be sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. Hit the notification bell. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe and smash the like button. And I also think this is the funniest movie. Oh, it's hysterical. It's really, really funny. Like, uh, Ron's character, they I think they understood how good Rupert Grint was at physical comedy, especially, like, the faces he makes. And so I think they really upped his his screen time for that reason. And he everything he does is hysterical. He really movie. came into his own as an actor in this film. Because in, in the first one, we talked about how um, Emma Watson was the best actor, clearly, of the trio. But Rupert Grint is hysterical and magnetic on camera in yeah this movie. the whole flying car sequence he is just he's making you laugh your ass off the whole time the face he makes yeah. when when they when they see the train and then when they're in the whopping willow he's like what's that mean <laughs> it's so funny <laughs> he's hysterical and then the car itself is just so funny how it has like a mind of its own and it becomes like this this uh forest living kind of entity on its own and it's it's great and i just enjoy this film immensely yeah and, and yes it's probably the funniest of them all like this and half blood are hysterical movies but it's also really dark and it, i know it's like made for kids so the tone it's i think it's, it's obviously pg but still we have scenes where there's like blood words words with blood written on the walls we have yeah. people being attacked and we have the giant monsters and i mean 
people so a, there's Ginny, great creatures in Ginny, this one Ginny weasley gets taken to the chamber of secrets where you know her her skeleton will lie forever so it's like really dark stuff and and the monsters are so good and terrifying like aragog and then the basilisk it's it's really great what they did the basilisk is so impressive it looks fantastic and i mean harry potter time and time again shows himself to be like the most badass person ever to <laughs> exist like remember in the goblet of fire when everyone turns against him it's like Yo, this guy has fought dragons and he's he beat a basilisk and he's beaten the Dark Lord multiple times. Why are y'all turning on him? I don't know. It's just you know you, you gotta hate a, you gotta hate somebody. And it's like in in Order of the Phoenix, how does he not have every girl asking him to the prom? That's not Harry Potter, man. <laughs> well, you know, and Half Blood Prince are trying to get after him, but you know he. he it's still like those weird hormones, and he, because he grew up with the uh, no, I'm, I'm talking about why aren't girls poor and like in line to ask him to the prom? Maybe they're scared of him because they're yeah. intimidated. But also, yeah. you know, he, every every semester at Hogwarts, he's like the talk of the town, but also everyone's terrified of him. Yeah, I think a, I think a lot of people are afraid of Harry Potter because of they they in this film especially they start to think that is Harry the heir of Slytherin? Is Harry part of is, is Harry similar to Voldemort? So I think they're scared of his powers and what he could be. Yeah, this one is such a great precursor because it sets up so much in terms of the relationship with Voldemort and Harry because he can speak parcel tongue, which like us, we he thinks that it's like, oh, I'm sure plenty of wizards can speak parcel tongue, but then we find out that it's such a rarity and uh uh, Lord Voldemort could speak parcel tongue and so this is the beginning we learn more about it in order for sure but there is a connection between Voldemort and Harry and he's trying to he's struggling to understand what exactly that is and what it means about him yeah and there's a ton of foreshadow in this movie for the future of the franchise but I don't want to get into it just yet I just want to tease it and get into it a little bit but I want to talk about just the production elements of the film real quick because it's astounding what they did they didn't get a single Oscar nomination for this movie not wardrobe not production design that's insane nothing which is incredible because the sets in this movie sort of Stone, they're obviously incredible, but the sets in Chamber of Secrets, amazing. Like Aragog's lair is like this beautiful, like haunted, like like forest area where like the giant these giant roots have created these caverns where it looks like these giant spires roam, and maybe they created those caverns. And the Chamber of Secrets set in general is just enormous. This giant real set and the production di design of of blending CGI with practical effects effects for the creatures. So like Aragog is practical effects, then Fox is both CGI and a practical animatronic robot. And then the Basilisk is also CGI in, a, in an animatronic robot. I, you could say that Chamber of Secrets is the best the set in all of the Harry Potter yeah, movies. It's, it's so really, impressive. It's, and it's gigantic. It's like, that's all real. None of it's fake. It's all like all those uh, sp snake heads, like the entire, the, the pools of water on either side. Unbelievable It's got to be 150 feet long, the yeah. set. How did that not get nominated for anything? That's absurd. And the animatronics, I think it, there are a couple shots of the Basilisk. Yeah, it's, not moving perfectly like with how like an animal would move but the fact that harry the close-ups when he's like attacking it it looks great because it's really there it's tangible because we can we know when something's cgi and when it's something clearly cgi it kind of takes us out of the danger of the, of the situation but when you see that there's a real thing in that shot with daniel radcliffe you're like that adds to the idea that oh this is a real thing and that makes it so much better it's just like jurassic park with the velociraptors you know a lot of the times a lot of the shots are cgi and you can obviously tell when you watch jurassic park but when the velociraptors are in the kitchen going after the kids it's like it's a real velociraptor it's yeah. incredible and even though you can tell it's a robot it doesn't move perfectly like an organic organ like an organic creature it still looks incredible and still holds up. Yeah, like the close-ups in Jurassic Park are amazing. But and also the the shot of the T-Rex uh slamming its face into the the caravan. Yeah. That is because it's such a it's a real thing and that makes it so much more terrifying. So that's why the basilisk even though it, there are shots that don't look perfect, it still feels real. Yeah, and they really it, compared to Sorcerer's Stone, the CGI, it's like it looks like it's years ahead because the troll isn't that great in Sorcerer's Stone and the Quidditch isn't fantastic. But I think Chamber of Secrets might have the best Quidditch match in general in the entire franchise. Maybe not CGI effects wise, but in general, it just looks phenomenal. But also, I mean, if they did the Quidditch matches in the later books in the movies, yeah. they, there's some pretty good ones. Half Blood Prince, they I wish they did more Quidditch in Half Blood Prince. Yeah, instead they just, just the, did Ron. They just did the, the yeah. practice and then they did the one match that Ron wins yeah. before he. But there are some great Quidditch matches in the latter books that yeah. they didn't film. I mean, there's more in this book, but the Quidditch scene is great, but then the spider scene, like the CGI of those spiders is phenomenal. The flying car CGI still looks really great. Yeah. The Basilisk again. 
But again, there's just so much more magic, and, and I love like the duel that they have. It's, oh yeah, which is it's so odd that when, like when they're like walking up, it's like the it's, music's it's going. A, it's epic, but like these are like twelve year old kids, and it's like they're gonna kill each other. <laughs> like they don't care about kid safety at Hogwarts at all. I know. Yeah, I mean people are being petrified, but like it's not like there's a quarantine. There's no curfew or <laughs> lockdown. Like they should be out of that school, and the, the teachers should be investigating what's going. They're on. They're not. It's like that. I told you about that uh, video I saw on TikTok the other day where it's um. Someone's pretending to be Harry. They're like, Professor, there's a monster around and, and attacking kids throughout the whole school. Then it cuts to Dumbledore, and Dumbledore's like, yeah, well, what are you going to do about it, Harry? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'm 11. <laughs> it's, not my, it's not my problem, yeah, Harry. I'll, I'll help you figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't kill Voldemort. <laughs> <laughs> but again, back to the CGI, because we get Dobby, a new character who we all love. Like, I don't know anyone who doesn't love Dobby in the Harry Potter franchise. And he's such a fun character because you don't know, like, his intentions at first. He seems like he's trying to hurt Harry, but he really (laughs) is trying to protect him. But the CGI is incredible because this is 2002 again. And, like, we saw Gollum and Lord of the Rings look great, too. But the scene particularly with Dobby in Harry's bedroom, Dudley's second bedroom that they, you know— Gave, Grace, graciously gave, gave Harry from the out of the kindness of our yeah, hearts. They gave him Dudley Suck in bedroom. There's the scene where he where Dudley has to keep punishing himself because he keeps letting on too many secrets that he shouldn't be saying. And he's hitting himself with the lamp and the lighting with the lamp hitting him is I never at the time I hadn't seen anything that good before. Yeah, because the Gollum shots are mainly very natural light and exteriors. So it's easy to to do CGI, but that was it's a very complicated thing back then to do lighting like that. And the reason why the CGI and Sorcerer's Stone actually isn't up to par with anyone's standards. And Chris Columbus actually said he was very unhappy with it, but they had the, the production was very rushed mm-hmm. because Warner Brothers, oftentimes what happens with big studio movies is, is they'll do they'll set up the pre-production and production, and then the studio's like, this is our release date. You have to get it done by then. And so this is a, a, an example of they just had to get it done by a certain date, so they weren't able to perfect the CGI. So that's why it doesn't look as good, even though it was only made a, a year apart. So the CGI was basically the same technology, but they had to rush it in the first one. Yeah, like the ghosts, I would say, in Sorcerer's Stone do not look good. Yeah. Like, that's probably the worst CGI in all. Like, the the troll you accept, but the ghosts, I think, don't look very good. But in Chamber of Secrets, they seem to just nail the ghosts, especially with Morning Myrtle. And I will say the only the only problem with Chamber of Secrets that I really have can see, and it's just a minor thing, is that uh, Dobby pretty much acts as the same thing that Hagrid acts as in the first film, propelling the story forward by accidentally revealing secrets. And it's kind of a, a storytelling plot device trick that JK uses to like get out of plot holes. But she eventually, after Chamber, she never did it again. But the, the first two films, I think because it was just hard to propel that story forward with these kids investigating these things. Like, how do they figure out these clues? And it's just a plot device that she used in both of these films. So I say that's really the only weakness in either of the movies. Yeah, like when he gives up the secrets about yeah. that's between Dumbledore and Nicholas Flamel. Yeah, shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't, shouldn't have, said, have said, that. said that. Yeah, he does it three times and then Dobby says like two or three things in this movie accidentally. So It is what it but is. It's just a little thing. It's a plot device that helps move the plot forward. And she never did it again. Yeah, but what I also love about Chamber Secrets is the acting's better. The kids got so much so much better acting it over the course of the year but the mystery of it i think is the greatest strength because the sorcerer's stone there's not much mystery going on yeah they're they're trying to figure out what the sorcerer's stone is who's trying to take it there's more discovery yeah, than mystery but it, it's not like a an immediate threat whereas the stakes are dramatically raised in chamber of secrets from the first story because students are actually being attacked by a monster in the castle and they're trying to all figure out who's behind it all is it a student is it a professor? Harry might think it's Hagrid. Did Hagrid release this monster in the cha- from the Chamber of Secrets? And then they learn about the Chamber of Secrets, like you said earlier, from McGonagall in Transfiguration class. And then just this great mystery of who's behind it all? Who's attempting to kill people? And then is it Harry? Is Harry the heir of Slytherin? Because during the duel, he uh, talks to the snake to tell it to not go after Colin, I think? Or... Which, which kid? No, is? Colin Creevy is the photographer. Yeah, I can't remember. Which. It starts with a D. Whatever his name is. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they all think that because he's, like we said earlier, he speaks parcel tongue, so they all think that he's the heir of Slytherin. And also, what I love about this film is it begins the tradition for the first several Harry Potter stories of 
each movie, each book, and each movie has a new defense against the arts teacher. Yeah. And this time we get Gilderoy Lockhart. Is a he, he is sensational. Kenneth Branagh was perfectly cast in this movie. He reminds me a lot of Patrick Bateman in terms of like the <laughs> arrogance, the confidence, the way he 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 uh, moves and and speaks. So he's he's so full of himself. But he's a fast like all of the characters. He is very complex on the surface. He looks just like this like superstar everything his fame has gone to his head thinks he knows everything but he's actually a much more complex character we learn when we understand that he actually is adept at memory charms and every kind every exploit and story that he's he's told and sold in his books is uh someone else's someone else accomplished those feats and he just wiped their memories and stole their stories and he's just a great, great character for this movie. Yeah, and a funny thing about Gilderoy, which they go way more in depth in the book, is like Gilderoy, he treats Harry like Harry's below him. Like Harry stopped Voldemort, the greatest dark wizard of all time. But Gilderoy like treats him like, oh, you're not even close to me, man. Like yeah. you're, you're like I'm MVP. He's like you're cute. That's cute. He like like especially at the bookstore when he's giving him all of his accomplished works, and they he, they smile for the photo for the Daily Prophet. As soon as it snaps, he pushes Harry away. Yeah. He's like, get out of here. I don't need you. And so because Gilderoy, he cannot stand not being the center of attention, especially like in his classroom when. Even though he's teaching up front, he still has portraits of himself all over the classroom. Yeah, it, it seems as though he, D- Dumbledore is kind of the only one who can he sees through him because I think the other professors he's they clearly think he's a, a bonehead, but I think that everyone kind of believes his exploits and his stories because they're the best sell. Like I'm celebrating 25 weeks on the bestsellers list, and I think that he's so famous that and he's new to the school. The teachers aren't sure. Is he really a great wizard or not? But I think Dumbledore kind of sees through him. I think they almost, they all know, like, obviously, Professor McGonagall hints at it later. I was like, oh, well, you're just saying, or Snape's like, you were just saying you knew where the the yeah, yeah. entrance to by the chamber the, secrets. Yeah, by the end of the semester. But the thing is, Dumbledore had to hire him. He didn't have a choice because they go on more depth than books, obviously, where the, no one wants the job. It's a cursed position, defense against the dark arts. So he kind of is just like, has to take what he can get. And that's why he eventually has to also, in the next one, hire, um, uh, Lupin. <laughs> Professor Lupin. I can't remember. Remus Lupin. I just forgot his name. Well, there's one person that's always wanted the job. Oh, yeah. Snape. Yeah. yeah but uh, Dumbledore wisely kept him out of it. He doesn't want to entice him to the dark side. Like, that sounds like Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> Attention. I have to bring you some great news about one of our favorite sponsors, Manscaped, the leaders in men's grooming, a company that helps keep the lights on for this show. So please check out their products at manscaped.com. Use our coupon code. Raiders of the Lost at checkout for 20% off and free shipping. And for decades, years, I was getting the cheap trimmers from the drugstore that are like $14. And they die after a couple of months and pull out all my hairs. And, you know, like a, like a barber with shaky hands. But Manscaped has changed the game for men's grooming with their Lawnmower 4.0, which is literally a rocket ship for your personal grooming needs. I recommend getting your hands on one of their packages, especially their performance package 4.0 which is a bundle of great products from Manscaped, including the 4.0 Lawnmower Groomer. And we just love everything that they've sent us. Their boxer briefs, their t-shirts, their colognes, deodorizers, their their men's wipes. So everything they've sent us, we still use today. Join the over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with their grooming needs and use our exclusive offer for 20% off and free shipping worldwide with our code Raiders of the Lost at checkout from manscaped.com. Fellas, you got to get on Manscaped products. Everyone listening, for the perfect gift for the men in your life, go to manscaped.com. They would love it. But anyways, so what also I love about the Chamber of Secrets is the trio, they're like officially best buds because in the Sorcerer's Stone, they don't, they're like kind of mean to Hermione until they save Hermione from the troll, which they event, they're, they're the cause of her going into that bathroom. And so they made up and become best buds. They all have each other's backs no, ma- no matter what. And in Chamber of Secrets, Hermione is the key to solving the mystery of the monster that it's a basilisk. She's the only person clever enough to see the signs without her brilliance, Harry and Ron, well, especially Harry, he wouldn't have been prepared to go into battle with the basilisk. And you can argue that he probably would have died instantly just like everybody else because he would have just looked it right in the eyes. Yeah, and Hermione, even though she's so vital to the plot, she actually loses a lot of story time in this one because, first of all, she she uh, accidentally turns herself into a cat with the, with the polyjuice potion, so she spends time in the hospital then. 
And then she gets petrified by the basilisk. basilisk so then she's in, in the infirmary after that. And so this movie, uh, unlike all the other movies, is very heavy Ron and Harry. Yeah. They're they're doing most of the actual screen time uh, investigations in this. Well, what Hermione did was mostly off screen when she investigated. And Harry, as we open the film up, he now has his own bedroom, finally, Dudley's second bedroom. But Harry's not receiving his letters. And that's when Dobby comes to say hi to him and mess up his life and try to prevent him from going to Hogwarts. But Harry ignores all those warnings of of of, of death that await him at Hogwarts and he goes anyways but also Harry is dealing with this internal conflict throughout the entire story where as he's learning about these connections he has with Voldemort like how he's a parcel tongue and he has these 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 dark thoughts sometimes and he's dealing with the conflict of being a true Gryffindor or a Slytherin because he remembers in Sorcerer's Stone when he first went to get sorted the hat wanted to put him in Slytherin he said you do great things in Slytherin it's all here in your head you're wrong and again now people think he's the heir of Slytherin so now he's starting to think am I Slytherin should I have been a Slytherin so and he even does some at some points think maybe I am the maybe I am the heir of Slytherin so, but the, but we know that he didn't do any of the yeah. acts so so Harry the audience is still with him yeah he's he's worried that as he's learning more about Tom Riddle too that he's he's too similar to Tom Riddle he's too similar when he finds out who Tom Riddle really is that he's too similar to Voldemort and one of my favorite scenes is when Harry is in Dumbledore's office about halfway through the film, and he has the conversation with the Sorting Hat, and he's like, "Did you put me in the right house?" And the Sorting Hat is like, "You you are particularly hard to place. And like I stand by what I say. You would have done great things at Slytherin." Harry says that you're wrong, and so what we eventually learn from Dumbledore at the end of the film. He's asking Vol Dumbledore why he's so similar to Voldemort and Tom Riddle, and if he's a really Slytherin. And Dumbledore says, it take a true Gryffindor to pull that sword out of the hat, which makes you very different from Tom Riddle. And it's our choices that show what we truly are rather than our abilities. So just because he's a parcel tongue and just because the sorting hat wanted to put him in Slytherin, it doesn't mean he's not a Gryffindor. Yeah, and also he wasn't born with those powers. Those... those Slytherin-esque Voldemort powers were rubbed off onto Harry when he was uh, when Voldemort attempted to kill him. So it's not like he was born that way. You know, he was. I think he was always born to be a Gryffindor. You know what I mean? Oh, I agree. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Because his parents were Gryffindor, and he has those qualities. So it's just like as we learn about Tom Riddle, and obviously we get great foreshadows of Horcruxes in this movie. Which let's just talk about Tom Riddle because he's yeah. such an interesting character, and also the, the the foreshadowing of what we'll get used to with Half Blood Prince in terms of in, uh, diving into memories. Yeah. So when we first learn about Tom Riddle, it's when Harry discovers the diary in Morning Myrtle's uh, toilet, which has been tried to be flushed down, and he starts entering the diary, and he's getting glimpses of the past or memories or this this young, handsome and very intelligent. How handsome. <laughs> It's an important character trait for the character. I know, I'm kidding. I you know, know what I mean. In a very in intelligent person, a prefect from the school, he seems like a like an interesting person and trustworthy person, is showing Harry these memories of Hogwarts from the past when the chamber was open again. So Harry, through this, learns that Hagrid opened the Chamber of Secrets. And the thing with Tom is, at, on the surface and at first, I think he resembles Percy a lot in terms of character traits. He seems like uh, he's... He's the perfect prefect and always does the right thing. But uh, we'll obviously learn later on that he has, he is the Dark Lord and he has uh, an intense darkness within him that he hides on this surface of being uh, as good of a Hogwarts student as possible. And the thing is, as bad as he is, he is desperate for for staying in Hogwarts. That's why he he turns Hart Hagrid in. Uh, even though he knows Hagrid isn't the heir of Slytherin, didn't open the, open the Chamber of Secrets because Tom Riddle doesn't have anywhere to go. He's an orphan. And so if Hogwarts closes down, he'll be left on the streets. And that's the last thing he wants to do. So he turns Hagrid in as a way of protecting himself and ironically protecting Hogwarts. Yeah, it's such a fascinating character because we get to look at, at Voldemort's past. And now we have like a physical representation of the threat of Voldemort rather than like the, the ghostly figure, soulless figure that he was in Sorcerer's Stone. And at first, the connection isn't clear. We think Tom is a friend to Harry, and he's using the diary to try to help him solve the Chamber of Secrets. But like we said, Tom is a prefect, clearly very accomplished student, but Dumbledore is the only one who sees something else behind the eyes of Tom Riddle that the other professors don't see. And that's why Harry's like, I bet you that's why he kept a, a close eye on you. Dumbledore saw right through you. And 
Like and, you, and and Dumbledore will will find out. He's always known that there's a darkness within Tom. Yeah. Ever since he first met him in the orphanage, he knows that there's some, there's a dark nature to the boy. But I think that Tom, when he comes into the school and uh, blends in really well with the community, he's able to hide that from everyone except for Dumbledore. Yeah, and he's we learned that he's so similar to Harry because how you just mentioned that. Hogwarts, he doesn't want to leave because it's his only home. Harry's only home is Hogwarts, too. So as we're watching these memories and we're learning more about Tom Riddle, he seems so much like Harry, which is so interesting. And even what I love that Chris Columbus and the and Steve Cloves did that I don't think it's in the book is, is Harry and Tom Riddle have the exact same conversation, word for word, same responses on the same staircase in this film. Well, not in the same... Well, Tom Riddle's on the staircase and Harry's in Dumbledore's office yeah. when Dumbledore asks both of them, is there something you want to tell me? And they both say no. And then... But they it's the same four back and forth answers, which is so fascinating to watch. But you can see when Tom Riddle's giving his responses, there's something he's he's keeping from Dumbledore on purpose and he seems sinister in, in his... In his, uh, in his uh, manner. Yeah, in his manner. But Harry... He's obviously lying, but he, you can tell he doesn't want to lie. Yeah. Because Harry, Tom, in in his mind, he's like, I can, I have a way out of this, and I have a way, I have a way of saving the school, even though it's not true. Whereas, and I'm the one causing all yeah, this. Yeah, whereas Harry is like, I think I know a way of, of saving everyone. So their intentions and motivations are complete opposites. Yeah, and I love when we get to meet Tom Riddle, and we get to talk to this person, and it's the first time we see Voldemort, really. Even though he's young, but it's it's so interesting to see what he was. This, again, this young, highly intelligent, very well respected student at the school, very handsome compared to the monster, evil being that he becomes later on in his life. But he already is that, not monster, monstrous. But Tom Riddle, at this point in his life, he's already begun making Horcruxes. He's already his. He's already, at this young age, even before this, when he was a young teen, he was thinking about taking over the world he yeah. was thinking about being the greatest wizard of all time and being an evil monstrous leader in kind of like a dictator in a totalitarian uh world of of wizards and he had these intentions and motivations at such a young age and so by this point he's made he probably what he made two horcruxes maybe by this point or so he's definitely made the diary so yeah. i would say just one at that time maybe because it's not point. later on until that he starts getting the magical objects after he yeah, leaves yeah, you're he right. starts to work at borgen and burke yeah. to make more horcruxes so, so he's already at this point made it so that he is immortal by making Pretty much like and he was a, a 16 when he did it yeah but in, in half blood prince he's probably like third year asking slughorn about the horcruxes yeah so you're right he did have this plan he was already splitting his soul so which means that he already at some point started to kill people maybe exactly and that's what he was doing with the chamber of secrets so maybe those those victims obviously from the original opening of the chamber of secrets was how he was creating the original horcrux yeah how he was splitting his soul before we get more into Tom Riddle and Chamber of Secrets, let's take it was our good. intermission break. Yeah, we're going to tease them so they, they want to come back for intermission immediately. <laughs> so our intermission will be a lot of fun. We'll ask some movie questions, do some trivia. And this is brought to you by our sponsor, Manscaped. Use our coupon code Raiders of the Lost at checkout for 20% off and free shipping year-round worldwide. Wide, 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 wide. All right, let's, let's do the movie quote. Movie quote competition. Hit me. I have two. So one is from a fan and one is from me. Who's the fan? Ethan Waters. To get even, even Steven, I would have to kill you. Kill Bill. Definitely. Yeah. That's with um, uh, Vivica A. Fox, right? No, it's, it's with Bill, I think. Is it Bill? Yeah, I think so. No, that's. I thought that was with... Is um, the opening scene? I thought that was with um, the knife fight. Yeah, it could be the knife fight. I think, yeah. I think it might be the knife fight. Because that's... he. Does, she doesn't say oh, that. Oh, because, yeah, because then she says, then kill your daughter. Yeah. Yeah, when she gets Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I think that's... Yeah, yeah that's that scene. Yeah. All right, I have another. I have one for myself, so I, I picked this one, and I'm gonna actually say it like the character says it in the movie. <laughs> Let's see, Cinderella story out of nowhere. Former game, former greenskeeper now about to become the master champion. It looks like America. It's in the hole. It's in the hole. It's in the hole. <laughs> I'm giving him a second. Bill Murray and Caddyshack. Yeah, <laughs> that, that was love, good. I love that scene. That was good. Cinderella story. <laughs> That was they didn't even write a scene. He just he's just hitting flowers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, everything Bill Murray did in that movie was just all hundred percent improvised. No nothing written. It's classic. All right, here's mine. I know what I have to do now. I've got to keep breathing because tomorrow the sun will rise. Who knows what the, what who knows what the tide could bring? Sounds so familiar. 
Want me to say it again? Say it like the character says it. Like, I feel like there's a beat in there somewhere. All right. I know what I have to do now. I've got to keep breathing because tomorrow the sun will rise. Who knows what the tide could bring? I, I give up. Tom Hanks and Castaway. Yeah. Oh, man. When he's talking to his friend. That's good. That's a good one. All right. Guess this movie release here. Let's go. The Bone Collector. <clears throat> Starring Denzel Washington and Angelina Jolie. I'm going to go with 2001. 1999. Ah, oh, shit. Yeah, that's older than I thought. Wow. It's a good movie. It's only two years younger than 2001. Huh? You said that's way older than I thought it was. It was just I said years. I said it's older, not way older. <laughs> You're right, added the way. Yeah, jeez, man, stop putting words in my mouth. <laughs> okay, here is my movie release here, Twister. Classic, first of all. Yeah, is this '80s? It's got to be. No, is this an '80s movie? I feel like it's like early '90s. Yeah, it's it's gotta be nineties. I'm gonna go nineteen ninety six. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good job. Thanks. Nice job. All right. Movie pop quiz time. This is a good one. It better be. In the film Ex Machina, what did Nathan, played by Oscar Isaac, base the appearance of Ava off of in terms of her looks? In terms of like the robotic body, not the or robotic, the face. her humanoid looks, her per, her personable looks. Is it a person? It's 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 not a person per se. It's is it Barbie? No, no, no. It's in the movie though. So oh, they talk about it in the movie. Oh, who he? Oh, oh yeah, I know. What it, it's um uh. Donald Gleason, Donald Gleason's character, search history, porn history, for porn history. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, Caleb's yeah. porn yeah. search history. Yeah, his, nice. His prawn history. Yeah, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> it's a good question, right? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a great question. Okay, here's mine. Tom Hardy, before he was famous, he played the villain in a major, big time Hollywood movie, a franchise movie. Do you know what it was? Star Trek. Which one? Um. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the I'll say you're right though but can you guess which Star Trek it was I don't fucking know shit about Star yeah. Trek the Star Trek Nemesis yeah, yeah yeah I would never have gotten that but it was in like 96 97 and opposite Patrick Stewart yeah and so he played a clone of Pat Stewart of uh, an evil clone and he is it's like he's so, no one knew who he was it's one it's actually one of his first movies he played the villain in this huge franchise and he is fantastic like he showed that early like how talented of an actor he is because yeah, i yeah. watched a scene after i got the fact i was like let me see some of it because i'd never seen it but i knew of it and i watched this the scene with him and patrick stewart and patrick stewart's a great actor but tom hardy like 24 years old is blowing him out of the water yeah, like, like a different level of acting that scene where they're at the table right uh it was okay. a different scene all right yeah there's there's but a that's a great scene, scene too yeah man yeah i would never have gotten to ne nemesis though yeah we I saw we, that a while ago we've never been star trek people yeah the movies are i like the movies but, but I've, I've only seen like the new movies like a few times but the older movies i've only seen them once the tv each. show we never watched yeah we were never really big into it i think it's because our brothers were never into it they always said it was like for nerds and dorks and so I think that turned our opinion against it negatively. Not that nerds and dorks only watch Star no, Trek. No, Star Trek is super, super cool. cool. Now that we're adults and have our own thoughts, like we think Star Trek's cool. All right, let's move on to biggest hater of the week. Let's go. All right, so we posted a clip, uh, just a, a American Psycho clip where we we're analyzing Patrick Bateman in one of the scenes. Who? Pa <laughs> Patrick Bateman in one of the scenes. And then this person commented, all these guys do is one-up each other. It's mansplaining times a thousand. And so then I wrote, please define mansplaining. I'm curious what their definition was. <laughs> then they wrote, well, for starters, that comments. What are you talking about? <laughs> That's first of all. So asking for a definition of a word is mansplaining. I think if, if you say anything, it's called it's mansplaining. I think this person no just doesn't like when two dudes are talking. I don't, I don't understand how they think we're one-upping each other. We're, we both were. It's like. We're making content for our fans that we're not in competition with each other. We're not like explaining things to each other. We're just, we both say things like trivia facts that we post on our TikTok. And it's like, it's just, that's all it is. If you've been listening to this episode, we're just going back and forth, analyzing yeah, stuff. Podcast. We're not one upping each other. But people don't understand that it's, it's TikTok. So the clips are edited up to just to be quick and concise and engaging. And in that clip, 
Is it just one of us talking? I think so. Like, I think there's it's, an, even another. An I think it's mostly me. Then you came into the, to the latter half of the, uh, app, the clip. Oh, so you think so? Having a conversation is mansplaining each other, but that's not even mansplaining. <laughs> mansplaining is like when a guy condescendingly or patronizingly explains something to a woman. That's that mansplaining she, that she most likely already knows. Yeah, that's yeah. that's mansplaining. Yeah, we're both dudes. Yeah. We're just talking about a movie. Jesus, it's so much BS. You can't, you can't win, man. Man, they 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 wanted to fight you, but yeah, you know they were hoping you'd say something stupid. But all I did, all I did was, what's the definition of mansplaining? <laughs> well, that's mansplaining right there. So opening my mouth. Don't ever speak again. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> let's go Come to our. On. Can you stop mansplaining me, please? <laughs> It's going to come up a few times. Um, let's move on to our biggest supporter of the week, which is Justin Weimer, who has been a patron since September 2020. Oh, a gee. top tier patron. So thank you, Justin, so much for your long time and continued support. That's like when we made our Patreon. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. We, we maybe had like three or four people that signed up in September. Yeah. When they when the first you signed up, we were like, oh my God, well, people, people actually like us? signed up. People like us. We're blown this away. Amazing. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. All right. On this day in film history, today is June 24th. Today is Gene Wilder and Peter Dinklage's birthday. I don't know how old Gene Wilder would have been. Um, John Wayne also died in 1979, and The Lion King was released oh, on wow. this year, on this day in 1994. Did you know that Peter Jean- Peter Dinklage used to be the lead singer of a punk rock band? Yeah, yeah. I saw photos <laughs> online. It's, it's been circulating the internet. It, it, it's it's really cool. He seems like he seemed like a cool guy. I'm, you can tell he, that's where yeah. he developed all his confidence, just yeah. singing on stage. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. he's. That's the one thing about him. He's so confident on camera. He's, he's Tony Stark. But it's like actors, like they they can oftentimes be very shy in public and on in interviews and stuff. And he he's super like very very shy and private. I think on interviews. But when he's on when he's performing, he is just so so on top of it. Yeah. All right. Streaming recommendation. I chose. Burn After Reading, which is a film written and directed by the Coen brothers. It's one of their best, I think, but it's like very underrated and kind of unknown. It's like under the radar. It's so them. funny. But um, it's on Amazon Prime right now streaming. So if you love the Coen brothers, if you like their dry humor. And if just, you like Brad Pitt. Yeah, if you, like, it's, it's got a great cast. Clooney's yeah. in it and then Tilda Swinton. Richard Jenkins. John Malkovich. Yeah. It's really funny. It's clever. It's just super dry humor. And all of these characters are just, it's hysterical. It's Osborne like this born. It's cock. like this espionage thriller of just all these people who think they're in espionage, but they're not. It's the thing is, it's it's perfect because it's a story that we've seen played out a hundred times, like an intense drama with espionage, yeah, but like a cold war pe- espionage. But the people involved with it are idiots. Yeah, exactly. it's like the people who shouldn't be involved with this are involved. It's like with Cold it. War spies, but yeah. all a bunch of dumbasses. Yeah, exactly. In Brad Pitt, it's his funniest performance. He's hysterical in that movie. George Clooney's really funny in it too. You think that's a Schwinn? <laughs> <laughs> Osborne Cox. Osborne Cox. <laughs> I am merely a good Samaritan. <laughs> People who've seen the movie are probably laughing. <laughs> Anyways, check it out. Before we continue, I gotta tell you all about movieposters.com, the number one place to get your posters online today. Don't go to Amazon.com. I know it's free shipping, but the quality is not even close to MoviePosters.com. They have teamed up with us to offer a very special promo code. Use Raiders15 to get 15% off your order today at MoviePosters.com. If you're a fan of movies, if you're a fan of TV shows, there's no better way to express that love than with a movie poster. They have all sorts of framing, backlighting, pretty much every movie imaginable. MoviePosters.com has it. Again, use our promo code Raiders15. Raiders 15 to get 15% off your order today at movieposters.com. And let's head back into our discussion of Chamber of Secrets and let's continue with Tom Riddle. And I love, like you said earlier, I love actually being, but I love being able to see a physical representation of Tom, even though it's not the Voldemort we remember from Ray Fiennes' performance. And this actor, I don't know his name, but he did a, he did a very good job. But I think it's just so fascinating because, like we said earlier, at this young age, he was such a monstrous being at this point already. And we'll learn more about it, but it's intense This who this person was at such a young age. Yeah, my favorite part about Chamber of Secrets probably is it when the first time you watch this, and if you haven't read the books, you don't know it yet. But it's the first time that we're exposed to a horcrux without knowing it. You know, obviously, we know what the other horcrux that we were exposed to obviously. in Sorcerer's Stone is. But the diary is the first Horcrux that we see destroyed. And then we get a hint from Dumbledore 
if you haven't watched all these, I'm sure you all have, but just heads up, there's some spoilers coming for the future of Harry Potter franchise. It's made $10 billion. I think enough I people think have seen it. I think we've all seen it. Yeah. But we get a hint from Dumbledore that Harry himself is actually a Horcrux as well. And that's when he tells Harry that Voldemort transferred some of his powers into Harry accidentally. None of them know this. But what he's not telling Harry is that Voldemort actually, it wasn't that he transferred part some of his powers. It's that he transferred part of his soul onto Harry, which is why he has some of his powers, turning Harry into the final Horcrux that he didn't know that he made. So neither Harry or Voldemort know this yet. But Voldemort, I don't think, knows it. No, absolutely not. Yeah, because he's, he's Vol- I mean, not Voldemort, uh, Dumbledore. He, he, he He's investing. He's, try- he's trying to figure out. Yeah. He's, un- he's trying to understand. I think before Voldemort returns in Goblet, what Dumbledore is doing is... On his own, he's trying to investigate how is he not dead? Why is Voldemort's soul still alive somewhere? And I think this is obviously a sign that Dumbledore is trying to connect the dots, figure out what exactly Tom did to preserve his life, even in death. But yeah, I think he's he's such a smart guy. Yeah, He obviously knew what Horcruxes were. So I think for him, the idea was in his head that this is how Voldemort did it, but he needs confirmation. He needs evidence. And the diary is the first piece of evidence. And obviously, I think Dumbledore, once he sees that it was killed with a basilisk vein, which is one of the which is an object that can kill a Horcrux, I think that's when he starts to realize, like, oh, he did it with Horcruxes. How many are there? Would he really go as far as to use the most magical number seven to do it? And then does he realize that he created Harry into one? It's a good thing no one uh, cleaned up the mess in the Chamber of Secrets. Because <laughs> then the teeth wouldn't have been there at, at Deathly Hallows. Imagine if there's like a janitor down Like Argus Filch is down there like, oh man, what do I do? I guess I'll just trash these. <laughs> Hermione and Ron like, where are all the fags? What happened? <laughs> it, they turned it into cubicle space for an office. No, no, there's just a bunch of a young teen witches just smoking weed down there. <laughs> it's like the new party spot. <laughs> Yo, we're in the Chamber of Secrets, bro. Chamber at 9 p.m. Bro, 420 downstairs. Fight, fight. <laughs> <laughs> There's gonna be some kind of magical. That's one thing JK never did. Any kind of like substances like that. <laughs> you can't put that in a kid's book. Yeah, I know, but I'm just saying. Like, I was like, what do kids do? Like, you know, people are trying to get trying to get feel nice. Like, you if know? you actually, if you like lick a mandrake sleeve, like it gets you buzzed. <laughs> <laughs> There's gotta be stuff like that. Oh, absolutely. Oh man, an R-rated an R-rated wizarding movie. That would be fun. Well, that'd be cool. That'd be pretty. Sweet. I mean, do you want to make? It sounds like you want to make the Harry Potter version of Train Spotting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Harry becomes a drug addict. Oh my god. <laughs> He's addicted to Felix Felicis. <laughs> Can't kick the habit, bro. I'm just so unlucky. <laughs> Anyways, Alora. But I think Chamber of Secrets is obviously the best scene in this film. It's so amazing. And then we have Harry versus the power of Lord Voldemort, which he uses is controlling the basilisk, which even though Harry speaks parcel tongue, it will only listen to Tom's commands. But one con I have with this movie, I would say with a basilisk, is that snakes generally have terrific sense of smell yeah. with their tongues. They don't out. even need to see. So they don't need to see. So even when he gets his eyes torn out by Fox, Riddle's like, he can still hear you. I'm like, what about his tongue? Can he smell? I would say because the snake is so big, yeah, uh, it's easy for it's easier for Harry to move around it because he's so small in comparison, where as the body of the basilisk is, basilisk is just gigantic. Yeah, but it's still, even like dragons have great sense of smell and like lore, so they just like, it's like a plot hole kind of, I guess you could say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. That's a good point. Why don't you write a book? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> but also, upon expanding on the world, we get new characters like Gilderoy Lockhart, uh, like the other Weasleys, and then also Lucius. Lucius Malfoy, I think, turns out to be one of the best villains of the whole franchise. He's not obviously the big bad, but I think uh, Jason Isaacs, who plays him, was perfectly cast like all the other actors. I think he definitely got this role after The Patriot. Because he plays like the same character in The Patriot. Yeah. And he's just perfect as this smug, yuppie, uh, racist, discriminatory man who uh, wants to rid the world of muggleborns and mudbloods just like Voldemort. Although he's clearly not strong enough or has the will to become the kind of sorcerer that Voldemort is. But he still is loyal to that man and loyal to those ideas. And we can see like... Now we understand why Draco is the way he is. And you can clearly tell that Draco clearly just vents about all the people at Hogwarts to his yeah. dad because he starts – he's like, oh, this must be Hermione Granger. And this is obviously one Miss of the Granger. Um And the way he speaks to Arthur, 
is the way Draco speaks to Harry. Yeah. So it, he is is his father's son, and I'm sure that Lucius probably bullies um, Draco all the time, which is, the, I mean, the psychology behind bullies is um, oftentimes in general bullies torment other kids because they experience torment at home in some capacity. Exactly. That's why Draco is so terrible. But both those characters, both Lucius and Draco, we begin to empathize with them towards the end of the franchise as well. But Draco, Draco is really good in this movie. I love Tom Felton. This is, I think, one of his best performances besides Half-Blood Prince because he gets a good amount of screen time in this one. Mm -hmm. And he's a great antagonist or, or, or opposing force to Harry in the film as well. And he has some great lines. He's really funny, and he improvised some of his dialogue. Like like when he's like, I didn't know you could read to crap. I didn't know you could read. That's an improvised line. That's, That's great. Because on set, he forgot the line, but he just improvised that. So Tom Felton's actually a really good actor. And yeah, we talked about he does a fantastic job in Half-Blood Prince. And I just think that, you know, Draco, there's some movies where there just wasn't enough time to put any of his storyline at all in it. And, and even some of the books, he doesn't have much to do. But Half-Blood in this film, he has a lot more to do in terms of the plot, especially Half-Blood Prince. And also Dobby is the, the servant in the house elf of the Malfoys. And we see how horribly Lucius treats Dobby. And that's why he's always trying to punish himself when Dobby is in his bedroom at at uh, Privet Drive, and then when he also comes and visits Harry in the hospital after Gilderoy has just removed all the bones in his arm because, well, at least there are no bones. And you feel no pain. <laughs> <laughs> but th that's a great scene, too, when he's drinking the Skelligro and Dobby comes. But we learn that's why Dobby does the things he does. That's why he's so scared and hesitant to tell Harry the truth of what's happening, really, and who's behind it all. And whenever he does reveal a small hint at, at, or secret, he has to punish himself because that's how he's treated at home. And, and the house elves, they're the probably the biggest thing in the books that aren't in the movies. Yes, Dobby yeah. and Creature are in the films. But what they don't show is that like the great feasts at the Hogwarts dining hall, it's all, all the food's made by house elves in the basement. And then, the, then Dumbledore literally transports the food from the kitchens into the great hall. And so the, the house elves are very much a part of institutions like Hogwarts and uh, wealthier families. And I think Dobby and the house elves represent, obviously, JK is making a parallel to slavery in the past. And I think that she's she wove in so many parts, so many uh, examples of history throughout humanity into these stories, which make them so dense when you read the books. You don't see stuff like that in the movies. You literally just see three elves, I think, in total in the films, and Creature just has a little bit to do here and there in, in Order and in uh, uh, Deathly Hallows, but they are very much a part of the world. Plus, there's that that overarching storyline, side star storyline of Hermione Granger in the books. Oh, where yeah, she, yeah, yeah. She creates Spew, which is the Society for the Promotion of Elvish Welfare, which is an organization that created in response to what she saw as the gross injustices in treatment of house elves after, I think, this, this I think this is in... um. Half Blood Prince when she, I mean, in a Order. Goblet of no, it's Goblet of Fire yeah. when she's at the World Cup and she sees how the house elves are treated there, especially as it's Cornelius Fudge's house elf in the book that gets into trouble with the wand, and so that's when she creates Spew, and that's an overarching side plot of her throughout the entire franchise from then on. Yeah, and then uh, it's just something that you couldn't fit into the movies in terms of the plot, and it, there's so much yeah. besides that. They that, can't like, just yeah. Those books are 700 pages long. There's yeah. only so much they can do. But Harry just seems to get himself into so much trouble or someone's trying to take him down. And we don't understand yet that it's Dobby trying to not kill him, but, you know, hurt him to send him home. And that's when he's attacked by the bludger during the Quidditch match, which is one of my favorite. Again, I think it might be the best Quidditch match. That's great. And the closing of the gate at the Hogwarts Express platform, nine and three quarters. That's why Harry and Ron can't, can't get through. And then they geniusly take the, the Fort Anglia uh, flying car to Hogwarts. And that's just a great scene in general when they're trying to find the train. They're in front of it. I think we found the train. Yeah, I think we found it. <laughs> so, but also Harry, he turns up into... Uh, the, the scenes of crimes in this movie over and over again. Yeah. And, it's, and even in Dumbledore's office where he shows up and Fox burns up, he's like, it wasn't me. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't fucking touch him. <laughs> he's always, it's always you three. <laughs> but I love Fox because the animatronic version looks really good. In, in on set. He's in the ride, isn't he? What do you mean? In the tour, uh, when you wait in yeah, line yeah. for the ride? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's that exact one. but No, but it's like the, there's an animatronic yeah, fox. Yeah. So it. that's at the Wizarding World. Hulk that was Hulk. like that was amazing. That's one of the coolest experiences. Is, if you all want to go to the Wizarding World, the ride itself is great, but 
it's so brilliant the way that you wait in line. It's like an hour long wait, but you're waiting throughout the interiors of Hogwarts Castle. It's really cool. And the best part is probably you wait inside of Dumbledore's office in line. And there's so much attention to detail. There's the craftsmanship of that place is just mind blowing. It's unbelievable. And actually sitting, standing inside Dumbledore's office is one of my favorite uh, theme park experiences it's ever. really cool. Not even the ride, just sit, standing there and looking at everything they have. It's an awesome way to wait an hour and 20 yeah. minutes for a roller coaster ride. But, um, Again, the mystery is fantastic, and I love the scenes where Harry and Ron... So this is after Hermione's been petrified, and they kind of have to figure everything on themselves with what she was, had already discovered. And then they get the hint from Hagrid to follow the spiders. Oh, the spiders! Why couldn't it be follow the butterflies? <laughs> That's what happens when you're a twin, everybody. And um, the scene with Aragog in the Forbidden Forest and his... The animatronics of this is great. It's terrifying. What was it's the so other cool. movie with the big spider that they did after this? Lord of the Rings? Yeah, then they weren't sure if they could top Aragog. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're different because that's yeah. all CGI pretty much. And then Aragog is complete. I don't think there's a single CGI shot of Aragog at all. Just when movie. he's little yeah. in the memory. Yeah, so just that. But when he's big, it's all animatronic robot. But yeah. they just keep him chilling. He's very old. But um, it's <laughs> at, this this sequence, it's it's like a horror movie at times. It's so terrifying. You can see how brave Harry is and then how... Until he sees what's going on. Yeah. But you can also see how skittish Ron is the whole time. Because he's, like, he's like looking around like, oh, these spiders. Can we go now? <laughs> But it's like a horror movie, but it's a great action sequence, too, when they're in the car and they're running from the spiders. And I think the action sequences in Chamber of Secrets are so underrated. Oh, yeah, 100%. Because there's, there's that, there's the, the just the car, and then the Whomping Willow with the car, and the Chamber of Secrets. And there's just so much to this movie. And the thing with this film is, like, it moves fast. There's not a, time, a moment wasted. You're just moving along, whether it be an action sequence or a great reveal of information or like Harry entering an, a memory. It's, it's fantastically paced. It's, there's no fat on it at all. Yeah, and more magic. And again, the mystery and people being attacked. So we have these students who are being petrified and also Mrs. Norris. So, and there's the mystery also is why is no one dead? Why are they only being petrified? And we have, because we learned that no one looked at Basilisk in the eye. Colin Creevy saw the Basilisk through his camera lens. Justin, that's his name. Justin saw it through nearly headless Nick. And after that, everyone thinks that Harry killed or petrified to get him. back at him. Yeah. And then uh, Hermione saw it through the mirror because she's so clever and she figured out it was a Basilisk. So she was going through the hallways of Hogwarts with a mirror to look around corners. And Mrs. Norris saw it through the reflection of the water. And I also, I love the build up to it because... Uh, throughout the entire film, Harry is hearing this voice, uh, and it, we we learn it's the Basilisk. But we we think that he is is maybe losing his mind a little bit, uh, and whatever's happening, it could be corrupting his mind. And it, 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 we end up learning that obviously Ginny's the one who did it all under the control of Tom Riddle through the diary. And it's a great great reveal because what what Chris Columbus did in in J.K. is they she, they showed us. Where the diary came from, right from the start. There's that shot in the bookstore when Lucius hands back Ginny's books. And I think Harry even notices, but he kind of thinks nothing of it, that there's another book behind that that journal. And it ends up being Tom Riddle's diary. And it's a, a great way of showing us, like, they showed us the clue right from the start of what actually, what actually who it was and what exactly caused it all to happen. Yeah, and there's great foreshadowing in the Chamber of Secrets for the rest and future of the franchise of Harry Potter. And there are so many hints at Harry's path as well in his story. So we have Horcruxes, obviously, not just their existence, their influence that they can have on people, for example. So how it possesses Ginny Weasley, just like how it has the effects on the trio in Deathly Hollows, but also how to destroy Horcruxes. And that's when Ron and Hermione in Deathly Hollows also use the Basilisk vein to destroy the Horcrux in Deathly Hollows. We also get a glimpse at the cursed necklace from Half Blood Prince, which is in Borgen and Burke, when Harry goes through the flu powder network uh, incorrectly and winds up there. We see the necklace; it's the same thing. It's so cool. And then wands. So Ron's wand breaks in the flying car when they're being attacked by the Whomping Will. Right before they're attacked by the Whomping Will. This foreshadows Harry's one breaking in Deathly Hollows. Oh, that's great. And also in Bergen and Bots, there's in the book we actually see the cabinet that Draco will, Draco will use in Half Blood Prince. They didn't they didn't put it in this film. I'm not sure if they thought it was if J.K. said, "Oh, you need to get this shot." It was totally necessary. Uh, you need to show this cabinet, but obviously they didn't film it. But it is a, a vital part and foreshadow to how Draco is able to get the Death Eaters into Hogwarts. Yeah, there's a few. There's like two scenes I would say that I wish they could have put in the movies that aren't in the book, and that's 
when Harry turns up in Borgen and Burke from the Flu Power Network by accident, Draco's actually in there with his father, just browsing, and Harry has to hide inside the cabinet, which mm-hmm. is really interesting. I think it's I think it's the ca- it's the cabinet, the invisibility yeah, cabinet. I mean, I mean the the cabinet that he uh, hides inside from Draco, and that's also where Draco. It's like the the hand of something, the hand of dust glory, which is what can eliminate all light in a room or a hallway, which he uses in Deathly Hollows. And then um, also at the bookstore, Arthur Weasley punches Lucius Malfoy and they get in a fight, which, oh, yeah. which would have been great yeah. to see in the in the movie as well. I'll see you at work. <laughs> <laughs> but it's cool to be in Nocturne Alley and see Hagrid. But Hagrid also, uh, in addition to the mystery, is there's something suspicious about Hagrid early on in this film. We don't fully know yet. And that's like, why is he in Nocturne Alley as well? It seems kind of suspicious that he's there. It seems like the lie of flesh eating slug repellent is a, an excuse at the time for he's why he's there. Liar. Um, but yeah, Hagrid, he has, he has a lot to do in the first and second one, but then he's kind of, you know, on the back burner for the rest of the franchise. But in this one, it's a great, extremely heartwarming ending when he is, um, returns to Hogwarts after Azkaban and he thanks the kids for, for basically saving his life. And, and Harry says, there's no Hogwarts without you. And yeah. It's just, it's, it's the most heartwarming ending we have in the franchise, I think. I think some people find it corny, but I like it. Because, you know, Hagrid's like a heartbeat of, the, of Hogwarts, you know? Yeah. He's part of that. Yeah. You, you need him. Yeah, gotta have, gotta have Hagrid. I love it. You got any cons to this movie? I would say just the, the con I said earlier of Dobby acting as that plot device like Hagrid in the first one, accidentally revealing things. Um, but otherwise... I think I think it's a really really excellent movie. Yeah, I mean John Williams' score is fantastic in this one too. He like matched Sorcerer's Stone pretty much, and he, he made it different as Ma- well. Too. It added some new themes, like yeah. the Chamber of Secrets theme is excellent. It's and a lot the, darker, and Fox's theme is really good as well. But I think for me, like my con would be that there's way too many push-in shots. It's like the camera's constantly like pushing. No, in. I love push-ins. There's too many. They're Dude. great. I love push-ins too, but they're like. There's a ton in this movie. You ever watched a Paul Thomas Anderson movie? It's not there, that, there will no. be blood is all push-ins. No, but it's his are slow. These are like ooh, we're going right into the close-up push-in constant. constant. I know PTA believes in a constantly moving camera, but they're very subtle. They're slow. All right, I understand what you're saying, but I, 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 I honestly love it. It's not, I think a, it's it's not a big deal. Yeah, I think I think that they're just like trying to keep us in the moment and in intrigued. I think it works best used uh, more efficiently. Okay, why don't you direct Chamber of Secrets then? I can't. It's already made. Anyways. I think we're. You'll make it again, but this is your pitch. Okay, I'm going to make Chamber Secrets, but no Less push-ins. push-ins. <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant. Oh my God. Oh, Genius. Let's, <laughs> let's just redo it. We'll, we'll redo them all. <laughs> all right, you want to do some superlatives? <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. Who's the MVP? I gave the MVP to Tom Riddle. Oh, nice. Yeah, great villain. We f- he sets up the stage for, for everything, and I think it's fascinating to finally see a physical representation of, to- of Voldemort. I'm giving MVP to Ron Rupert Grint. Hey, yeah. Because he's just so funny in this movie. He yeah. really keeps... Because he is like the... Acts as the audience kind of. As he's he's kind of tag team with Harry with solving everything. But he's just... I think he's what keeps you so grounded in the story and like having such a good time with this movie. Yeah, that's a great pick. Great pick. What's your best scene? Harry and Tom Riddle in the chamber. I, yeah, I'd say Harry versus the Basilisk. Yeah. I, I think I like... I just love the dialogue that they have back and forth, too, versus, mm-hmm. like, him fighting the Basilisk, which is epic, but I just think, like, him and Tom talking is so interesting. Yeah. Best shot. When Harry enters the Chamber of Secrets and we have the, the wide shot of the entire set, and it's just incredible what they built, this enormous set. It's so cool. And he's, like, running down the entire hall. Yeah. I My favorite shot is when Tom Riddle writes his name uh, in the air. And the anagram moves around to form I am Lord Voldemort. I think it's just such a great moment and shot of the movie. And it's like, oh my god, what a twist. Best actor. Christian Coulson, who plays Tom Riddle. I think he's just very good. He doesn't have that many scenes, but he chews it up real well. He kills it. Yeah. I picked Daniel Radcliffe for this one because he really carried the movie in this one. His acting got a lot better. And obviously he's still the namesake of the of the franchise. So he's in nearly every single scene. And he did a, a really, really good job carrying it. Best line. Voldemort is my past, present, and future. Nice. And then he does the, I am Tom. I am Lord Voldemort. That's Tom why Lord. you're Slytherin. <laughs> That's an epic line. That is an epic line. Yeah. My help will be given at Hogwarts to all to those who are still loyal yeah, to it. That's why you're a Gryffindor. I mean, not. It's why you're a Ravenclaw. Yeah. And wish you were a Gryffindor. I never said I wish I was a Gryffindor. <laughs> That'd be pretty dope. But Raven, we're we're great. Ravenclaws are awesome. We're wicked smart. Yeah, wicked smart. Sure. 
Just cheating on your exams over there. Don't need to cheat. <laughs> Sounds like something you would do. All right, let's do some fun facts about Chamber of Secrets. Take it away. Daniel Radcliffe improvised a great line in this film when Lucius Malfoy says, let us hope that Mr. Potter will always be around to save the day. And then Dan improvised his response, don't, don't worry, worry, I, I will be. be. And again, Tom Felton improvised that line as Draco talking to Crab and Goyle where he says, I didn't know you could read. That's crazy at, at that scene when Lucius literally tries to kill Harry right there outside yeah. of Dumbledore's office. I would say that's a con for me where yeah. like, I don't, that, that's a little drastic where he's going to kill Harry yeah. outside of Dumbledore's office. Yeah. He's it's clearly a, saying the Avada Kedavra curse. Yeah, I think they obviously want to raise the stakes. It's a movie, so yeah. but I think it just doesn't work for people who like know the lore super well. Yeah. And it was a the really characters. dumb thing to do yeah. by Lucius. Obviously, it was you, Lucius. <laughs> <laughs> who else did it? <laughs> in the Chamber of Secrets, the Opal Necklace, which plays an important role in Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince as the Cursed Necklace, can be briefly get, can be greet can be briefly glimpsed inside a display case in Borgen and Burke's shop in Nocturne Alley when Harry first enters after traveling through the flu network. Rupert Grint has such a severe case of arachnophobia, he has still not watched the entire scene where Ron and Harry are in, ha are in Aragog's Hollow. In that scene, Ron's frightened look and uncomfortable squirming throughout was not from acting, but Rupert being legitimately terrified at even the thought of spiders. <laughs> Eddie Redmayne, who plays Newt Scamander in the Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them franchise, actually auditioned for the role of Tom Riddle. Hugh Grant was, origi Hugh Grant was originally cast as Gilderoy Lockhart, but was forced to withdraw at the last moment because of scheduling conflicts with two weeks' notice. He would have been good. He would have been, been great. He would have done a good job for sure. During post-production, producer David Heyman went to visit Richard Harris in the hospital. Though he was very weak from his illness, Harris insisted that the role of Dumbledore not be recast. Sadly, Harris died shortly before production was to begin on Prisoner of Azkaban, necessitating a recast. And it's just a, it's a shame that Richard Harris passed away during the production of this franchise. He was an incredible Dumbledore, but I think Michael Gammon definitely filled in the shoes really well. Yeah, he did a great job. But that shows like the drive that Richard Harris has as an actor and just wanted to stay being a part of the story, even to his, on his deathbed, he's like, no, I can still do it. I can mm. still, I still have the heart to do it. Yeah. Incredible. And that wraps our episode on Harry Potter in the Chamber of Secrets. Thank you so much for tuning in everyone, wherever you are listening and watching around the world. Really hope you enjoyed this. Stay tuned for all of our new content. Don't forget to check out our movie news episodes, which are new segments on Sunday mornings where we discuss latest topics in film and television. Go to RaidersOfLostPodcast.com. Check out all of our content and merch and become a patron today. Take care, everyone. Raiders of the Lost Podcast is a Mirror Image production. Sound mixing done by Jacob Kosler. Opening music by Chase Jackson. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost podcast. Hit that subscribe button and notification bell. Listen to the audio formats of Raiders of the Lost podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and wherever you listen to podcasts. New episodes every Monday and Thursday. Support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost podcast.